Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. It is working for me. Beautiful. Okay, what else do I need to do? Fantastic. I don't need this. Oh, okay. Okay, so I guess I guess it works. Going to post the uh, Etherpad link in the chat. Uh, yes, it's actually in agenda as well. I think, but yeah, post it. I'm right. on it. Uh, thank you. Switching the windows. Okay. Actually, I just realized five minutes ago that there are two other links. Uh, links. One is in the ITF site for interim, among other materials and other stuff, and another one is the Brian created. I think I have <laughs> consistent. Yes, I think we have consistency on slides and agenda. <laughs> anyway, it's a good start. Uh, a good start. <laughs> yes. Um, um, anyway, uh, well, table I, one on agenda in on the slide. So I think it doesn't really matter because I will check both after the meeting. But yeah. let's let's keep the stuff in the one that's in the agenda. Yes. So yeah. Uh, and that's the one that Brian just pasted into the chat. Yes. Right, no, I figured I'd paste the other one just to confuse the hell out of everyone. No, I, I pasted the, the 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 one that we're using in the chat. Brian, I don't know what year it is anymore. <laughs> I don't know what day it is anymore. Uh, my slide said 3rd of June, but I'm afraid I'm living in the future. It's 4th of June for me now. So, actually, I don't know. Shall we start? Uh, okay, slow start. All right. Slow start. Uh, slow start. Uh, I don't know yeah, if we were... Uh, let's see. Okay, my local time, right? So I will be very slow today. Okay. So I would, I like would another, be your... I would wait another minute at least for all of the people who are on our um, agenda as presenters to show. Uh, you see what's happening, right? Because I'm sharing my screen. I'm presenting. I have no idea what's going on. Yep. <laughs> that that's that's why I'm here, Jen. I got your back. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. You two are the right. best. So we got. No, I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> we've got we've got everybody in the agenda up to Spencer, and beyond Spencer, we are still waiting for a Gory. Yeah, we will be fine. We, I think we have a few minutes. We have a little bit of, we have a little bit of, um, of slack in this, right? Uh, well, not much. Yeah, okay. Nobody's going to kick, kick us out of the room, right? Sure. Why not? <laughs> it's how it usually works at ITF, right? You see people open the door, trying to walk in. It's not going to be the case this time, so. Exactly. I thought you were asking me to kick you out of the room. I, I can do that, but. No, no. no. And I, I know from previous interims that you can run over time and nothing happens, so they don't automatically shut down the meeting. They probably should, actually, right? You should be on time. Okay, we can wait another minute, I don't know, 303. Uh, 
I can talk slowly until Gory shows up. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, we can, we can also like we can do a we can do a slow start with with my thing, right? So. Yeah, so I think we could probably slow start with welcoming everyone yeah. to the June 2020 interim pass our networking in the time of coronavirus. <laughs> so, uh, oh, well, how can I do? Oh, that's bigger. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So you. It's just like all right, yeah. So this is not well. I do hope it's the right one because it's the same one Brian presented last time. I hope you've seen that before. If don't, please check it out. You know where to find the slides, right? Just in the case they all links are in the agenda. So, oh, I need to. Oh, I need to click recording, right? I guess because this is supposed to be recorded. Okay. Oh, it's already happening somehow. Wow. Yep. Cool. Good. So, how can I get rid of this? Okay. So, uh, it's virtual interim. Please, please excuse me. I've never done that before. So, uh, let me remind you uh, some special things about having virtual meeting. Uh, I was told that you having difficulties joining the audio by computer, try calling option from your phone. It's recommended to have your video off unless you have a funny hat or something. Uh, unless you're speaking, please mute your microphone. It does help. Webex chat is only to join the mic queue. Everything else should go to the Jabber room. To add yourself to the queue, press plus Q, and Brian will kindly add you, add you to the queue. And if you changed your mind and do not want to talk anymore, please uh, put a minus Q in the chat. Uh, there is a virtual blue sheet. Uh, agenda and those slides have the link. Please add your name and affiliation there so we know that you've been listening. And yeah, we have a session jumper room. Oh, very important thing. Tommy is not joining us today, so we do not have a minute taker. We need a volunteer. Please. I sent an email, but I have not got any response. So... This is your opportunity to write down what all the decisions are. Just saying. <laughs> Maybe that motivates people. Yeah. Yeah, you can power and you and in the chairs will be very grateful please i know that we have recording so you probably can just listen to it later and put everything there but it'd be good to have notes yeah yeah speech right, to text or something let me look at the let me look at the attendees in the ether pad and pick a victim yeah. Um, yeah, we can. You can volunteer someone, right? Can volunteer no. someone. Um, let's see. Who could I volunteer here? Uh, well, Spencer. Spencer is an excellent minute taker, um, but he's also presenting some stuff, so that's probably not great. Um, Lucas, could I ask you? And Lucas remains muted. Um, <laughs> So he said yes. Uh, no, uh, you can ask Brian, but Marwan isn't very good. Marwan Mar Mar said that he would be willing to do it if truly pressed. Uh, I think I think we are truly pressed, Marwan. Um, I'll help you out. I'll back you up. Okay. Yeah, I'll help Marwan as well. Okay, cool. We're doing uh, this yes, in direct, the Etherpad, right? Direct in the Etherpad. That's why we got the uh, so underneath each of the uh, the headings in the uh, in the thing. Yep. Thank you. So we have actually fully packed agenda. So uh, I don't know if anyone has any last minute suggestions or changes. Three, two, one, 
Sold. Okay. Sold. So, well, so what's going on? Uh, uh, probably important announcement. We are inclined to change to virtual interims twice a year, right, Brian? And twice a year, yep. Yeah, most likely not collocating it with ITF weeks, just something like what we're doing right now. So probably it will reduce some pressure time-wise from people. So be ready. Don't be surprised that you do not see a Pine Energy session scheduled during virtual ITF. And we have three doc active research group documents we are going to discuss today and a number of interesting uh, presentations. So the first on agenda is Brian. Brian, do you like me to open your draft or you like to present yourself? Let me see if I can figure out how to present. Um... Oh, you need to drag something, but l let me see if I can uh, do that. Oh, hold on, reclaim host role. Let me do that. Oh, I don't have the host key. Okay. I I I think I am a host, but uh, let me assign control. Wait, make presenter. I can do that. I have all the power. Excellent. I am okay. now presenter, so you, I should be able to share. Yeah. Uh, oh, except to... for right on this computer, um, I do not. Yeah, I can't actually show you the. So okay, here. Okay, I I, I will. I will send you a link. Okay. Uh, we send you a link in the WebEx chat. Okay. Uh, let me see where you is go. it. Okay, chat. Okay. Yeah, I actually. Okay, now I'm going to present your thing. Uh, share. Yeah. Okay, you see it, right? Yes. Um, so, um, hello, everybody. Uh, hold on, actually, I should turn on the video because I was told that I should sh share video if I have a funny hat, which I do. Um, so there we go. Um, this is my this is my Panergy hat. Um, and it looks even sillier with the headphones on. So, excellent. <laughs> nice um, hat, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this is um, the ritual discussion of um, current open questions in Pathware Networking, uh, draft IRTF Energy questions 04, um, where I ask the research group whether or not we should present this, and then I get uh, either the answer yes. Uh, in which case we will uh, present publish this uh, and which is there I'll either get the answer yes in which case we will somehow um, fail to publish it uh, or I get the answer no in which case we will um, keep it open and make um, a few minor changes to it uh, until we have the next one of these meetings where we'll ask to publish it and then we will say yes so that seems to be the the ritual that we're following um Jen if you could scroll down to the the diffs in the um, in the table of contents, there are no actual diffs in the table of contents, just page number changes. Uh, I just wanted to bring this up to show, um, sort of what we think the questions are. Um, so, um, there are 8 questions we think are open, um, having to do with vocabulary path properties, how you distribute them, supporting path selection, so on and so forth. Uh, after the last time we discussed this in Singapore, um. Uh, I got some feedback, uh, I believe, from Teresa, but I don't remember who, about um, making sure that the language and vocabulary of path properties actually um, covered the types of things we're thinking about uh, in that vocabulary, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so if you can scroll down to the diffs in 2.1, um, I guess it's probably better if people actually want to read through these um, to go and actually have a look at the um uh at the changes this is the only substantive change change to the document and like the changes to the table of contents were just page number changes because this got larger um so this is essentially pointing out the issue that we have that some things that we might think of like path and path element properties come with temporal scopes um this is is um dug into much more um uh, in much more detail in the in the path properties um, draft, um, 
and yeah, that's the you know pointing out that temporal scope is part of the problem that we know that we need to solve here. Um, so with that, basically, so each round um, we get um, you know one or two minor comments. Uh, I would actually ask uh, whether we can go ahead and say, hey, we have research group consensus um, out on the list. Obviously, uh, to publish this as a snapshot, right? Like so, the the zero three. Um, re revision of this um, changed open questions in pathware networking to current open questions in pathware networking, um, putting a timestamp on it, which was 2019. Since the questions haven't changed since then, I think that's reasonable to keep that timestamp um, and say, okay, we're going to take the snapshot at this point in time, and then maybe you know do you know once we've done a little bit more work in the space as a research group, to go do a retrospective. So that would be the question that I would ask. Um, does anyone have any any comments on that? This is Spencer, um, and, I, and uh, I would I would just say I think this is a good enough list of research questions for us to publish uh, to help guide the working group and to be able to explain. To people who might not be participating as a research group, uh, to explain to people uh, who might not be participating in the research group now what the research questions are. So I, th I, I would, I, I think you could be through. I think I'm through. Uh, I see a question from Teresa. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's actually question or cue. So I would just say uh, I also think we should publish this as a snapshot and maybe we should do like a research group last call before we do so. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Gory. Hi, Brian. Um, it's Gory here. Um, I wonder whether we have to think a little bit about defaults and what we think is normal when we don't have a signal. Um, maybe that's part of the research question of untangling it, but it seems that as I look at paths, there's always some assumption about what you think is a normal path that is influencing the way you're using it or your design above it. So do we need to say anything about this or is it partly implicit in answering each of the questions as we go through? I would, personal opinion, I would think that that's a, a detail of each of the questions and it's implicit in each of the questions that you need to have reasonable defaults because it's one of those things that you know we don't talk a lot in this document about implementability because we think that implementability is actually one of those things that needs to be you know kind of solved on its own um so i would right like so if i, I, I when, when you said defaults i started looking at the document and thinking about how i would add you know there need to be sensible defaults um, and I would add, there need to be sensible, sensible defaults at least to sort of 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4. Yeah, 2.7, right? Like, so I'd be, I'd be happy to leave that implicit. Yeah, I think I might be as well. I just wanted to ask, um, I guess we just need people to read all these things, which sounds like a working group must call, and we're in a research group, so a research group must call to read the document. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, you're welcome. Although uh, I noticed that like this document's going to expire relatively soon, so actually I might, that point about implementability, I might add a sentence about, of course, if it's not implementable, it won't deploy, but, um, and implementation requires sensible defaults. So I might actually add a sentence based on that comment. Um, whether that's before or after we send it to a research group last call, I, I'll probably write the document just to make sure it doesn't, um, it doesn't expire during research group last call because that makes the tools unhappy. Hey. Uh, queue seems empty. Cool. So thank you, Brad. So I guess here we've seen the new version and then we'll initiate the last call, right? I have homework. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Oh, great. Okay. So, next is vocabulary of the past properties. And let me get the slides. Okay. Oh, work. So, hello, Teresa. Uh, hi, everyone. Maybe first of all, can you hear me well or? Yeah. 
I can hear you well. I don't know about the rest. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I'll start my presentation then. Yeah, so to just tell me when to switch to the next slide. Yeah, I'm presenting. Okay. So yeah, uh, today I'll present the first version of the IRT draft of a vocabulary of path properties after uh, the working group decided to adopt the document at the last meeting. Um, Therese and I prepared this revision and we tried to incorporate as much feedback as possible from the last meeting and try to address most comments. So next slide, please. So the first change we did is in the terminology. So we didn't actually change the path definition, but we tried to make um, our idea of this path definition more clear. So what we try to highlight is that um, entities, like uh, endpoints and entities in the network, I have different visibility of path, but it might not see all the path elements, but only on the sub path or on the higher level. And also, um, the entities might treat the path at different level of abstraction. So maybe a BGP router does not care about anything else than like um, shared level paths or this kind of stuff. And essentially, what what this boils down to is that a, a path can be a sequence of physical nodes. Sequence of logical nodes, for example, um, a set of routers contained in a single AS, or it can be like um, specified up to the physical or link layer technology used, or just in um, kind of a logical sense saying, well, this is just a, a path from a source to a destination, kind of in the way that current internet works, right? You have a source a destination and you don't know anything or you don't have guarantees for anything between them. So yeah, we extended this um, definition to make it a bit more comprehensible, but we didn't actually change the definition of the path. Uh, next slide, please. And then we added um, a new item to our terminology, which is a reverse path. We already had this we already use this terminology throughout the, the document, but we didn't have um, like a separate item, so we decided to add it. It's simply um, a path that is used by the remote node in the context of bidirectional communication. So this is kind of a natural uh, definition, and we already used it, so this is just to make it a bit more explicit. Uh, next slide. Then um, we reworked the use case section. So here we mostly did structural changes and textual changes. So for the path selection, we did some small textual changes. And then we removed the performance monitoring and enhancement use case, since um, it seems that this use case was going too much in direction of uh, internet measurements, actual path measurements, which is not what if you want to show that path properties are useful for in this in this draft uh, vocabulary of path properties. And then the traffic configuration use case, we split it into two use cases, namely protocol selection and service invocation, to kind of make it separate these two concepts which are not, not exactly the same. So protocol selection simply states that an endpoint or a node network can select an appropriate protocol or configure protocol parameters given the path and its path parameters, uh, path properties. And service invocation looks at entities that want to that want to invoke additional functions that influence the path um, elements. So an example of this is using these zero RTT transport converters allow a path or a subpath to use MPTCP or TCP. Uh, next slide. 
And then um, we added two new path properties. The first one was also discussed in the last meeting and um, it's with tr transparency. And we decided to define this as a standalone path property, which is the definition as follows. So um, a node is transparent with respect to a protocol if it doesn't modify uh, this protocol, any of its headers, and its processing is independent of any protocol headers. So, um, for example, an IP router is typically um, transparent to transport protocol, right? While a network address translation device looks at the transport protocol headers and actively modifies them. Another example is maybe kind of a firewall, which doesn't modify um, like, like transport headers or contents, but it still looks at the transport headers and the application layer headers and um, to decide whether you should block or not. I think there's... So Corey, do you wanna, do you wanna go ahead and ask now or should, should we have one now or do you wanna um, wait to the end? I'll wait to the end, Zero. Okay, cool. Then I continue. And uh, the next path property is kind of a logical follow up from the reverse path. So we have a symmetric path, um, which simply states that two path are, paths are symmetric if the path and its reverse path in the context of um, bi directional communication consists of the same path elements but in reverse order. Okay, and that's, next slide. Then um, another discussion points, point during the last meeting was about security related properties. So for example, confidentiality or integrity. And Therese and I, we, we thought about this and we think we decided not to define um, additional path properties for, for, for these properties. So let's say confidentiality and integrity. Uh, instead we added uh, one or two paragraphs in the security considerations section. Um, the reason, we're not sure if it's a good idea to add additional properties, path properties right now is that it's quite difficult to characterize these properties. You need to consider a threat model, otherwise they don't really make sense. So um, you need to look at like the environment, different entities, and um, which protocols are used, what is its actual use case. And um, additionally, you know, we think that the path properties that we defined so far in the draft and the security related properties are um, orthogonal. So in a way they're, of course not complete, but kind of independent from each other. So typically what the path should give you is connectivity, while the, the security related properties are then just um, using this connectivity by, by using some protocol to um, establish, let's say, a secret channel. And um, I try to illustrate this with these two bullet points. So you can say that path properties describe what function the network applies to the packets while the security related properties describe what function the communicating parties apply to packets. While it might be the case that not only the endpoints, but also path elements, let's say, are communicating, this is not the typical case. So I think it's, I don't know if it's a good idea to make an additional path property for this. Yeah, next slide. So then we had some uh, minor modifications. Um, so in the access technology, we emphasized more on the physical and link layer. Instead of saying, well, the first hop or the first few hops since, since our path definition can be like maybe a different level of abstraction, it doesn't really restrict the scope so much as if you say it's physical and link layer technologies. And um, for the service function, we incorporated our new path property, which is symmetric paths, as, a, as an example for NATS, I think. 
micro translations. Uh, next slide. So that's already the end micro presentation. Um, so what we're mostly interested in is what you think about the transparency property and the new security considerations content because that's the biggest change. The other changes are more textual and structural or not really significant. So yeah, please I'm looking forward for the for your feedback. So Corey. Hi. Well, I'll take a different question, if I may. Um, you've created um, a term reverse path and symmetric path. But you don't, but you, they seem to be um, based on routing exchanges, as in other words, the, it follows the same set of nodes, but the return path presumably can have its own properties, which could be entirely different to those of the forward path. Yes, so symmetric path only means that, um, that two paths, which are still independent, the forward and the backward path, that they that they are symmetric in the terms of which entities they traverse. It's true the properties could be completely different, but this is just to to um, to talk about this scenario, right? It's not we don't make any assumptions that these paths should or sh or must be symmetric or not symmetric. I don't know whether I like symmetric path yet, or whether I want to call it a symmetric rooted path, or um, or, or something which kind of clarifies that there's no symmetry in the other parameters. I was actually also not sure about this path property. The reverse path property, I think, is quite natural if you have bidirectional communication. But the symmetric path property is a bit um, can be tricky, I think, to define sometimes if you have like service functions and things yeah i mean survey functions don't require a symmetric path they require that, that node sees the traffic in both directions is that not so yeah, yeah for example yeah, yeah so, so so we we we've seen service functions deployed where the paths are very different in the forward and return directions but they do pass through a single point of coordination or two points of coordinations which themselves talk with one another. So, 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 so this is interesting to dig. I was only asking to, to make sure you thought about it. It wasn't um, a criticism. I like what you've done. Um, I think we should carry on doing this. Thank you. So um, I put myself in the queue. Uh, I also wanted to, um, uh, to pick on slide five, I was actually going to talk about the, so first of all, everything Gory said, I was going to mention that on the, the symmetry of the path. Um, uh, on the other side, there's sort of transparency. Um, I would, um, you know, in a former life, I did a whole lot of work on stuff that we called path transparency and we defined it kind of like this. Um, but in thinking about it, I, I would have made it a little bit more gray than this, right? Like, so there's, so here you say no transparent if it doesn't modify the headers and it processes packets without looking at the headers. And there's sort of two different parts to that and certain nodes will actually pull those two parts out, right? Like, so there would be a, you could have transparency in the sense of it might actually look at the headers without changing them, um, which will have certain um, implications for the types of, of protocols you can use on that path. And then there's one where it actually will try to change the headers, in which case it has other implications, right? So I, I would think that at the very least, transparency would be sort of like a three way as opposed to a Boolean. Um, so, you know, read only, read write, and doesn't use it at all. Um, there might be more shades of gray than just those three, but I would, I would um, suggest considering at least having those three. Now that I think about it like a blocking. So D3 is set plus one level, like it blocks or doesn't block. Right. So for example, right, like so the you know, an IP level router could actually look at the IP address, but it's not gonna if the IP address 
changes within the the net blocks that that router is going to put down that 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 path, it's actually not going to change, right? Like so, it's you know you can change the IP address, and if it's a router with a default route, it's still going to put it out the other port. Uh, whereas if it's an IP address with NAT, it's also rewriting, which you know changes the semantics of those address spaces. Um, so yeah, uh, I think this is this is a a again this is pretty much exactly when we started thinking about path transparency. This is pretty much exactly what what um, how we defined it as well, um, but I, I would make it a little bit more nuanced here. That's very good. Idea. Cool. Thanks. Spencer is next. Spencer. Yeah, let, let me. I, 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 it's, it was not anymore. Um, so uh, I think a follow-on question to the previous two, which is, if you're talking about symmetric paths, uh, are you talking about a path that is? Viewed symmetric, viewed as a symmetric path at the same level of abstraction, in both directions. I think you have to look at the same level of abstraction. Otherwise, the symmetry, I think, doesn't make. You could maybe say symmetric path, exact path. But yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I was just asking a question. I'm not maybe not even asking for a change. But thank you. And the queue is empty, going once, going twice. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Next, Spencer. Okay. Okay, your floor is yours. Excellent. So I'm also wearing Cool. That. Um, so, talking about the pathware networking obstacles deployment draft uh, dash zero uh, eight, and could you advance that to the next slide? Uh, so, basically, these are the changes that we've done since IATF one hundred six, which is the last time we talked about this. I got uh, we were doing uh, research group uh, last call in December and got. Good comments from Teresa and from uh, Michael Scharf helping me respond to Teresa's uh, 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 review and then from uh, uh, Med. Uh, and then I finally noticed that I'd misspelled uh, Olivier's uh, first name in uh, the first paragraph of the draft, like seriously, but uh, sorry. Uh, but I, that, that's what's happened since ITF 106. Uh, we could be finished, uh, but are we? Um, and could I get the next slide, please? So, um, the question about what is pathware networking anyway, I got this call more than a couple of times, especially at last call. Uh, I've seen that comment on other PanRG docs. Uh, I added something that might not be completely wrong in uh, Dash 06, uh, Section 2. I have no reason to believe that most of the research group even noticed it, and the draft was adopted by the research group. So that's probably not good. So let's talk about what path aware networking actually is. Next slide, please. So this is the text that I put in as uh, uh, 1.2. Do people need a moment to look at it? I'm not hearing anyone say no. Hear us reading. I can hear the I can hear the brains chugging. Yeah, this looks perfectly reasonable to me. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, everyone, please step away from the mute button. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the questions draft, uh, has some description of path aware, uh, path aware internet networking ar architecture, uh, that talks about 2 important properties and, uh, what that is. And there's more in the introduction, but, uh, you, you kind of get the idea. You, like I say, you can, you can check that out on, uh, the dash 4, uh, version of, revision of, uh, the questions draft. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the the path properties draft um, 
refer uh, basically defers to the questions draft. Um, so um, we have uh, at least a couple of of uh, competing definitions uh, in the in, in the research group drafts. Uh, the next slide, please. So. Um, my point is that I'm not sure we have a canonical definition of pan now. Uh, it could be the one in PanRG questions, uh, although that seemed a bit more about architecture than pan itself. Um, I had the question of whether we needed a canonical definition. Um, and um, we could talk about that on the PanRG mailing list if we what it would be, but uh, just to get a feedback from in person, whether this is helpful or not, um, and also where to put it. Um, yeah, what not to do is a horrible place for it. Um, so uh, I'd love to be deferring to a draft that is not bad ideas. Um, and no, that's not that's not right. I would like to defer to a draft that is not about uh, ideas that didn't receive deployment. Uh, the path properties could work and then uh, point to that. Um, but uh, maybe there's a better place, but we can talk. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, that, that one, absolutely. So um, I put myself in the queue first, but uh, I'll actually let Teresa go first because, you know, hogging the queue as the queue manager is a is terrible, um, terrible practice. Okay. Um, so I, I think, yes, we should have like a definition. I think the questions draft is a good place for it. That's why uh, I link to it in the path properties draft, but it should probably be a little bit expanded or there was also in, in one of the reviews that we got from Matt on the path properties draft, he asked if maybe we should have like an entire architecture draft about the architectural assumptions that we made in the path properties draft. And then we dialed back the, the assumptions a little bit, but still there's some kind of like architectural understanding. I don't think it's enough for an entire draft. So I think it might go in the questions draft. I don't think it goes in the path properties draft. Cool. Um, okay, so that's me then. Um, hold on, let me let me let me think about that for a second. Um, all right, I am unmuted. Uh, so, actually, can you go back to your last slide? Jen, can you go back one? Yeah. Do we need a canonical definition? Um, my personal take on this is no, we don't or at least not like a succinct canonical definition. Because if you look at the questions in the questions draft, they sort of lay out a, a space for research. And if you look at essentially the attempts to answer similar questions or related questions in what not to do, um, none of them are really phrased in the same way Right. as right. the questions in the questions draft. Um, so I would say that, I mean, to the extent that we need the canonical, a, a canonical definition, we can actually make the canonical definition be the entire text of the questions draft, right? Like, so these are the types of things we are interested in, but I explicitly don't want to prejudice any sort of like, you know, it has to fit into this particular projection of this particular. Right. right. Right, we we of architecture, in order to be in order to fit here, right? Um, I understand why like um, reviewers would be confused about this, right? Because it's like this is amorphous and it's purposely amorphous. Um, I think the idea of a like an architecture draft makes sense only to the extent that it gives people who really really want to have an architecture draft something to chew on. Um, I think it should, if that drafts, um, normative language is longer than its boilerplate, then that's a failure. Um, uh, whether that should be like a section of questions, 
um, just to avoid having to take another draft through the process. Um, or because I mean, like, it's literally like a paragraph or whether it should be in, you know, its own one paragraph draft. I don't really have an opinion. Um, but in general, I would say that like the, the need for a canonical definition or the need for a a prescriptive architecture for, for path aware networks at this point primarily just is there to give people an unsatisfying answer to a question they feel like they really need to ask. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's, I mean, on the other hand, it's not a lot of effort, so it's certainly worth the effort to address. Um, I, so would let me, be, I would be fine adding a one paragraph section to, to questions to handle that. Okay. Um, so to, go to ahead, this, Spencer, and then I have Teresa and Gori. Uh, go to the best of my knowledge, you and I have never been awake at the same time talking about both of our drafts on the definition, because I just because I've added it since the last ITF meeting that we met it in person. No, we have not. Yes. Uh, so uh, one thing that we could do is have the two of us chat uh, and uh, come up with something maybe merged out of what I had, which what I had, I should have said this was kind of taken from some of the text in the charter. Mm -hmm. So uh, for you and me to come up with a proposal, put it in the questions draft and I can, and I can point to the questions draft in my draft. That seems, that seems perfectly reasonable. Uh, one thing I wanted to say that I forgot before I, I started on my, my um, thing there is, is basically, I don't see, so you're pointing out that we have three definitions that differ from each other very slightly in um, in sort of their wording uh, and people who really want a language lawyer it could actually see that 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 um, implies a difference in scope I don't I think those I think all three of those are perfectly um, perfectly compatible with each other and I don't think that there's a scope problem but that's um, maybe because I purposefully want to keep this amorphous for the time being um, so I think the overlap of all three is fine. I think, yeah, like if we just sit down and try to be awake at the same time for like a couple of minutes, uh, maybe bring uh, Therese and Cyril into that as well, um, which makes the awakeness slightly like two times as more difficult, but um, yeah, we can we can deal with it. I'm good at, I'm good at minus nine. Um, uh, it's, it's getting easier. Yeah. So yeah, so I, that that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. The, the other thing I wanted to mention, because so I use the word canonical, probably inadvisedly. Uh, that's that's what you that, that's what you would want. I mean, but you're supposed to say that when I'm wrong. Um, but you know, this being a research group, um, things that don't fit the canonical definition can still be interesting to a research group. Yep. Where that's not true for an ITF working group. Yep. So, so for us to not think of it as a canonical definition, but just to get kind of, you know, here's what we think is going on in a general way and to have one place where we point to that says, here's what we think is going on. That, that, that makes seems reasonable. Me. I mean, it, yeah, just to answer the question, that seems reasonable. Uh, Teresa. Yeah, I agree with what was said. Uh, that we maybe don't need the canonical definition. I was also just uh, I thought I thought we should also make sure our charter reflects our scope, right? Because yeah, our yeah. charter also explains what path aware networking is. Yeah, um, yeah. counting the charter, we actually have three and a half places where this is described. So we have more definitions than we have documents, which is awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Yeah, we need to clean this up. Um, <laughs> Excellent. So, Teresa, you and Cyril, would you like to be in on on whatever call we pull together? Sure. Cool. And we'll and we'll propose the results to the yeah. uh, research group. Excellent. Yeah, Gory, do you want to be in on that call? <laughs> I could be. And um, I have something to say because when we publish documents in TSBWG in the IETF, there are always people come and try and beat me up, saying that transport is end to end. Full stop. <laughs> and and I, I think so. I think it's important to have some text that kind of explains the path is at the core of all this stuff. And I, I, Spencer's text looked okay, but I think we need to agree on some words. I hated one word in Spencer's text, which was a word the or the before ah something. 
<laughs> this is what happens when you get IETF people writing IRTF documents. My apologies. Sure. Uh, but 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 generally, I, I liked it. So and I, I think it's useful. Um, so I go with everything everyone else has said, and I won't say more. But yes, I'll happily talk about it with people if they want to have another mind. I'm happy. Cool. Fabulous. So um, could I maybe, is, is the queue empty? I'm sorry. I think it is. Yeah, the queue is empty. Okay, cool. Keep on, keep uh, on. If you want to do the next slide, please. Uh, and then the one after that. Uh, so I think we know what to do with that question about the uh, generally what's going on global definition. Um, so that's good. Thank you all for uh, your help with that. Um, on behalf of all of the authors and charter editors. Um, and could I get two more slides back? Uh, you can skip the next one. Uh, that would. No, sorry. I'm this sorry. One? Two more. Two more slides forward. I'm sorry. Uh, Four. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This one here. Um, I mentioned this at 106, but uh, the the goals for this dra informational draft were to inform uh, research in this research group, which is fine that it's still a draft in the research group. Research outside this research group and engineering outside this research group. And it seems to me that we need to publish in order to inform uh, activity outside the research group uh, that that uh, that uh, this morning I'm being this morning I'm being uh, recruited to help with a another buff that uh, uh, is in this space the IETF and uh, I would love to be able to. Uh, Provide information to uh, engineering that's happening outside this research research group, uh, which is one of the things most valuable things I think we can do with this draft. So, questions: Are we finished yet? And if not, what else do we need to do? We said that we it would be great if we were um, came up with a uh, one one general idea of what we're trying to do. Uh, and that's good. Uh, is there anything else that we need to do with this draft before um, requesting publication? So I will throw myself in the queue and say, um, I think we're done modulo whatever tiny changes you want to make to the language based on our where the definition goes thing. But yeah. um, and, and I think and I think my definition will be ripping out everything that's not pointing to the 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 one the one true general idea. <laughs> yep. The one true you do what you want. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh anything else? So is that like a with chair hat on, that is a request that the next revision of the doc gets research group last called. Uh, the last version was research group last called. Oh, right. Okay. So then the next version gets sent. <laughs> Excellent. Um, fabulous. So, uh, so either okay. that was a plus one, not a plus Q that was one key off, correct? <laughs> yes, it was a plus one. I agree what you were saying. <laughs> Just making sure we're not running over you there. Cool. Cool. So, um, I think I'm on next also, am I not? You are on next. Hey, yeah, you're on next. Let me get the slides. Uh, I will observe we're doing pretty good on time uh, right now. So I would actually say that uh, if we end up uh, at the end of this with any um, time available, uh, we should just make that call with those of us um, who are going to bang out the next version of this. Just be like at the end of this interim meeting and we should just anyone who wants to be part of that discussion should just stay. Since we're already all here and awake to some extent. Okay. Uh, you, so you have, you have me going now? Go for it. And no, nobody said I was yeah. awake, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, so the other thing that I was asking to talk about, and this is not something that's gotten a lot of work of uh, mailing list attention yet. So uh, thank you all for putting this on the agenda. Uh, but whether there were design goals for path aware networking, which uh, knowing what we're generally trying to do would probably help 
that idea also. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if my my thing is basically if somebody proposes migrate pathware networking approach, how do we know it's a good approach? Um, that maybe we should have design goals. There, we have the idea of a uh, beautiful baby contest where you line up all the beautiful babies and see which one is the most beautiful baby. And if you don't agree on the definition of beautiful before the babies arrive, you have to tell people that their babies are ugly. That seems wrong to me. Uh, next slide, please. So question, do we already have design goals for PenRG? Uh, we learned a lot in uh, what not to do uh, in section two and section three. Uh, number one, we did not have very many filters for adding contributions to section five. I believe the only filter we used was that we were just, we were including uh, protocols that had gone through ITF standardization at least part of the way. Um, and some of those con contributions dated back to the 1970s. Some of the goals have been dumped. The entire, we learned a lot, but the entire draft was backward facing. And I think there are some things to think about in the future that were not impediments to deployment in the past, like privacy, but probably are design goals now. Um, I'm curious about what else would be new. So if people wanted to jump in the queue for that uh, in a minute, um, or if you want to jump in the queue now for a discussion about that in a minute, that could be great. Um, and it seems to me that this, uh, agreeing on design goals would help us uh, provide a document on what to do. We've been asked for that repeatedly, and um, and um, maybe we could provide that. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to talk about this for a second because this was a little bit the model that I was thinking about, and I. I was not the person that suggested this, but um, someone smarter than I did did. Uh, the research routing group uh, came up with a design goals for scalable internet routing and published it as an RFC, uh, which was a, con a pri prioritized list of design goals for the target architecture. They started with 19 RFC 1958. Uh, so this is the internet architectural principles. Uh, they set out a bunch of design goals uh, for the future. Um, they're all short. I don't think any of them are page long. Uh, probably the average is about a half a page. Uh, and then they provided a summary of the design goals. Uh, so that was what was in 6227. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the question is, is something like that a good model? Um, it seems to me that what we're trying, agreeing on what we're trying to accomplish would help us. We won't all have the same goals and no other goals. And this is different from RRG. There's only one internet to do internet routing on, but there could be lots of different kinds of PANs. So this, this may be more of a list of uh, a, what, a, intersection list than a, no, sorry, a, a union list rather than a intersection list. Um, it seems to me that we could continue discussion about this on the mailing list, but since we're all here to get together now, uh, we could talk. I think that may be, is that my last slide? Yes. Yeah, cool. Excellent. So please discuss. Uh, so I am actually just, um, uh, in the interest of, of uh, fairness, going to keep my position in the queue before Teresa this time. Um, so, uh, like that sound of the the scrolling in the background is um, those of us who didn't see your slides before um, uh, reading sixty two twenty seven as fast as we possibly can. <laughs> um, and like I was looking at, at at that was you know includes me. I was also looking at sixty two twenty seven, and I noticed that like some of the ways that some of these goals are are, you know, are phrased, um, are kind of along sort of like sub points in the text in the questions draft, right? I would think the design goals for a path aware network is basically you need to solve two point two and two point three, so discovery distribution and trustworthiness of properties, and way to do path selection. Um, 
the interfaces for path awareness are something that you need to actually deploy it. Like you actually need to be able to write programs that use it, right? Um, and then the rest of them are kind of like higher order, um, higher order sort of requirements to get it deployed. So I think that if you basically take question two, two and two, three and tear them apart, that turns into the beginning of the design goals for, for path aware networking. And that might, you know, we might actually want to have that as a separate document because I don't want to stuff design goals into a questions draft. Right. 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 Uh, so, the, and let me say, let, and can I agree? Do, do you want to keep talking or do you want me to agree with you now? Well, let me keep talking because I think you're going to disagree with the next thing I'm going to say. Um, so I'm actually looking at 6227 and to some extent, um, the reasons that people care about path aware networking are um, some of the design goals for the new routing architecture as well, right? Like, so um, the one of the path aware um, uh, architectures that actually seen some implementation and pilot deployment is Scion. And one of the big goals of Scion is routing scalability, right? Like, so um, actually fixing the problem of needing gigantic piles of, um, of um, uh, TCAM all over the network uh, by actually pushing that to the edge. Um, scalable support for traffic engineering. So endpoint traffic engineering is essentially QoS, right? Like so, so the difference between traffic engineering and QoS is who's making the decisions, um, and that is a uh, also like a a um, a key goal. Scalable support for multi homing. That's also a key goal. Like I mean, we could almost it it, it struck me a little bit, um, uh, you know, how much of the design goals from the routing area from when was 6227? This was 2011, a decade ago, yeah. are basically design goals that we still have for Panergy or for Pathware Networking because they're the same problems that we have with the current internet. Um, so I think we have to, like, we don't, if you look back at 6227, the, uh, of all of the things on this list, the only thing that came through the IETF process and saw any kind of of um, sort of implementation. I'm not sure about deployment. Is the decoupling location identification with Lisp, right? Yeah, the rest right. of it, the extent to those, the extent that those problems are solved, those problems are solved. Like so, scalable support for mobility is all by architectures outside of the IETF and and outside of the internet, um, uh, sort of the internet protocol stack. So, I would use 6227 a little bit as you know maybe a uh a pattern um in terms of it's got the same boilerplate on it and the same general document structure but um what i look at when i see these 11 points is an attempt to boil the ocean um and uh we're trying to do the same thing in panergy right it's like let's change the space of architectures that we can deploy in the internet that's that's a different ocean to boil um, but I'd be cautious about like trying to solve all of the problems at once because these all these problems are the same problems that we care about, right? Right. So let me let me uh, rave for a minute, and I'm not going to disagree with you much. Uh, the first thing I was going to say was you're you're looking at the uh, you were looking at the questions and the questions draft, and I would suggest uh, sprinkling stuff out of what we learned in section two and section three out of what not to do. Because because there, there there are you know there is we we were doing work there too that was going to going to drive uh, the things that we still need to do and that we think matter and things like that. So I think that those are I think that throwing those both up in the air and uh, picking up the pieces could be a really good uh, way to get started. I think that uh, I agree with you on. Uh, the boil the ocean nature of uh, of uh, sixty two twenty seven, and um, I think you know the other thing was if you go back and look at where the RRG came from, and I was paying some attention to this, but there are probably even people on this call that know more. Um, my recollection was that. Uh, this was that internet routing is going to die very soon uh, in the like 2006, 2007, whatever the IAB workshop was on internet routing. Um, but uh, 
but uh, you know they they were kind of more under the gun for fixing internet routing than maybe we are for solving all the problems of PanRG. So, right, but I would I would notice that 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 workshop was basically I mean it was about like a a um, perceived pending emergency in the size of the routing table, and yeah, the design exactly. goals ended up being eleven points long. Um, so. <laughs> um, whereas it's really the only, the first design goal was the reason, the reason that they showed up and it's like, well, if we're going to mess with it, we might as well mess with it a whole lot. And, you know, <laughs> I, I'm afraid we're kind of doing the same thing here, but, um, at the same time, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid that, well, no, I actually, I think it's a good, it's a good exercise sort of like take sections two and three of, um, of what not to do. Um, accelerate them uh, to a very high speed and slam them at that high speed into sections two, two, and two, three of questions. And it might be that they annihilate each other and we just don't know what to do, right? Like, so we know what not to do, but what to do is is still up in the air. But I think that actually sort of like sitting down and trying to trying to tease that out is also one of those things that I really wish that we could actually get on airplanes and get in a room because that's one of those things that like an actual physical whiteboard would be super useful for. You're still you're still very close to a super collider, aren't you? I yeah, we did see every so often like all the <laughs> stuff on my desk shifts toward Geneva. It's it's kind of scary. I, um, I I get that. Yeah, we're we're getting loopy. So let's uh, Teresa. Yeah. So when I read uh, Spencer's email in January, I think, which I, I think I asked this question first, I thought that. Uh, the problem st statement for scalable routing might be a little more narrow than our problem statement for Panergy. I mean, I don't think we really have a unified problem statement. Right, we were right, actually right. just discussing that, right? <laughs> that we kind of, whether we need a unified um, definition. So uh, how to solve the questions in the questions draft might also depend on your specific uh, problem statement and your specific use case. And then maybe there could be trade-offs between like different design goals. And so I was wondering if maybe maybe a good place to or an interesting place to start would be to try to identify uh, existing path aware technologies that were already successfully or semi successfully deployed and analyze what they did right and then sort of uh, map out a space of different specific problem statements where people use path aware technology and then have maybe have this be a sort of what to do instead after the what not to do draft right. So that's just some idea I had. And I also put that down in an email in reply to Spencer in like January, if you go back and read the mailing list. So um, I, 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 I remember that and I think that's what I was thinking about when I was thinking about uh, whether this was the same thing or not. Um, but I, I, I agree that it's not. So um, yes, uh, this, this is not the same as the the pan or the the pan problem domain is not constrained the way the uh, routing research uh, group dom uh, problem domain was constrained. But yeah, I mean the other the other thing was the idea is that this is uh, at least theoretically going to drive uh, work in the IETF very soon, uh, and this may not be as uh, this may not be as um, under the gun as the uh, routing table explosion was. Next. Colin. Um, I, I think get a little, perhaps a little um, nervous when you start talking about design goals. Because that to, to me suggests that, you, that you're trying to design a Thing or a single architecture, um, and I, I'm not sure we're quite there yet. Um, oh, I agree. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm not sure what what the right term might be instead. Design principles, maybe, or guidelines, or uh, I don't know. But uh, I, I would caution against tightening things down in a way that that funnels things onto one architecture at this stage, uh, and so we better understand the problem space. If I was going to try to make a Band-Aid fix, I might suggest doing something that was some design goals. Because, you know, as we're, as we're saying, whatever we're doing is not going to apply to all the pans everywhere for all time, 
anyway. So, yeah. and I suspect we might end up with some quite different pathware architectures that have very different goals, but but share some core principles in common. Yeah, that would that would be a that would be a very helpful observation for us to outline a, a uh, document like this. You know, what's a principle and what's something else. How different can a pathway networking architecture be, but still uh, fit into the scope of things we're talking about? Yeah. And just being the IRTF, that's, you know, the scope is broad, but not infinite, but it is broad. <laughs> so. Exactly. Definitely agreeing. Thank you. Russ. So um, I think the situation in this research group and the RRG are quite different. Yes. Um, there we had uh, uh, one group of people who thought the internet was about to melt down through the explosion of the routing table and another group uh, within the research group saying, keep calm, there's things coming along that are gonna make this okay and trying to create the document that you were just pointing to um, was kind of the uh, the prioritization in it was one of the mechanisms that they used to uh, keep from killing each other, I guess. But um, I think we have a very different goal here, which is if we can do something to implement a PAN, what are the benefits to the applications that use it? And so I think that would be uh, uh, more helpful to people who are working on this than a, uh, especially an ordered list, but even a collected list of goals that are sometimes don't even fit well into the same puzzle um, because they're somewhat orthogonal or, or trying to uh, approach different aspects of the, the reason you want path awareness. Yeah, I think this is what, what happens when you, when you um, take puzzle pieces and try to use them as Legos. Um, I, think that, I think you're right, exactly right, Russ. And I did have confidence that somebody on the call would know a lot more about the RRG his, or the uh, uh, yeah, the RRG document uh, history than I do. Well, that was exploding while I was IETF chair. Russ, everything exploded while you were IETF chair. <laughs> but thank you. So I was in queue, but we're out of time. I'll take it to the to the discussion after. Um, you know, it, it seems like there's. Um, uh, definitely some appetite to try and do something here, um, to not, um, uh, like bolt it down too, too hard. Uh, and we'll take that back out to the list and I guess continue that thread from January. Sounds like a deal. Thank you. Um, and we'll, we'll try to do the right thing. Sounds good. Next up is Gory. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Let me get the slides. Okay. Okay. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay, so this set of slides is related to the discussion we've been having in ETOSAT. It's very much about paths. It's only a little bit about path aware networking because at the moment we're not quite there. And you'll figure that out as we go through because maybe the solution is path aware networking for many of the problems we have. I'm going to be talking about um, paths of a high bandwidth delay product particularly paths where the return or reverse path is asymmetric, so it is different to the forward path. And I'm basing this on some threshold analysis uh, and um, 
part of a set of data we've collected using a test bed, looking at Quick with Quickly Chromium and some performance of TCP using Reno. Right, next slide. Okay, um, basic message here is forward paths are not the same as return paths for many people. Return paths are not all the same. So we're going to focus on the return path for the moment. Uh, return paths for many protocols mainly just carry acts. They're just small packets sent occasionally. Do they matter? Yeah, they do. If you've got a gigabit per second, then you're probably about 5,000 acts per second crossing that gigabit infrastructure in the return direction. And different types of return path have different properties. Some of them are a bit congested. In other words, they have capacity limits or some form of contention ratio, which limits the capacity by time of day or other users, or they are limited by the packet rate they can support. Many of the technologies we have out, out there in the real world um, are asymmetric because return packets actually consume a lot more resource than forward packets. So it's important to look at this stuff. Next slide. Um, in Spencer's vein, let's go back into history and find out what happened. We have TCP. TCP designed with a ratio of one to one originally. That used 3% of the capacity in the reverse direction simply for carrying acts. And everybody agreed that was far too much. So TCP acts every other segment or is recommended to act every other segment. Overhead about 1.5% of the traffic devoted to acts. Actually, that's still too much for many deployed infrastructures. Um, and if you actually do an analysis of network traffic, you'll find that stretch acts are common with uh, one act every three or one act every four packets. Many of these thinned packets are generated by um, offload cards that, that reduce the um, number of acts, or they're generated by thinning in the network. Thinning is widely used to get down to less than 1% of the forward capacity. That's where we are. Then the top line of this chart from TCP is just a statement of the current state of the art. Along comes Quick. Quick uses 1200 byte packets. And you can see immediately in comparison, Quick takes a lot more capacity, roughly twice as much as TCP. And Quick's been specified to use an ACK for every two ACCUistic packets. So it consumes about 3% of the return capacity. Um, much more than one, which is the target for many operators. And is this could be due to the fact that Quick uses 1200 byte packets. So what happens if you use 1500 bytes? Well, it's a little bit better, it goes down to about 2.3%, but still way bigger than 1%. So we wrote a draft about thinning acts to 1 to 10. In, the network. in other words, just basically changing the act response of the Quick client so that when it receives 10 packets, it will send one ACK rather than every other packet it receives. Next slide. And we had a scenario to look at. And because the ETOS SAT mailing list is all about satellites, we use the Quick for SAT architecture. And we looked at a number of scenarios um, 10 megabit forward with a 2 megabit return, which is a 1 to 5 capacity asymmetry. 10 megabit forward with a 0.1 return, which is a 1 to 100 capacity asymmetry. And we also looked at 50 megabits with 10 megabit return and 50 megabits with 0.5 megabit return. Um, these numbers are not actually that uncommon. DSL has an asymmetry of about 1 to 8. And I think many people who use cable modems experience sort of asymmetry, perhaps one in 20, one in 40 capacity asymmetry. So this sort of asymmetry is very common both in the satellite world and outside of the satellite world. And act thinning is a commonly deployed method used in all of these, and also in Wi Fi drivers. Standard Wi Fi drivers that you see for Wi Fi chipsets implement a form of act thinning. So, next slide, please. Let's have a look at how this. Generation of acts in TCP is affected by these asymmetry scenarios that I've just proposed. So looking at the performance of TCP, 
uh, with a 10 megabit forward link and a two megabit reverse direction path. Um, you can fill that path with 10 megabits per second of traffic. Um, it actually consumes 16% of the return path um, transmitting just X, which is okay. If the asymmetry grows from one to five to say one in a hundred, which is the 10.1 scenario, then TCP's forward data rate becomes limited completely by the amount of acts that can be returned across the path. And um, goes down to three megabits per second with a one to one act, um, one to two, the default for TCP, it goes down to six megabits. It's limited by this. And you can see this is the motivation for act thinning. Um, the red boxes display places that are limited by the return rate of the of the traffic on the path. In the north red boxes, I've shown in percentage the amount of capacity consumed. And some of these numbers are um, a basis for concern. Um, the, the packets just carrying acts can consume quite a lot of capacity. And nowadays, we tend to worry about capacity in the return direction, perhaps more than we used to. Uh, people are doing more uploads since they're working at home. Many people are doing like we are. They're using video. I'm setting video on my return path. And fitting that into the capacity pool is creating real pressure on this infrastructure. Quick, as currently designed, is not helping this at all. Let's go forward one slide. Next slide. Yeah. Um, basically, too much back traffic um, is not helping the transport protocol, but it's squeezing out other traffic on the return link. And this is a real problem. Go to the next slide. I'll show you what the effect is on the traffic. So um, real data, real, real tests showing chromium traffic. And you can see here a set of lines that show the packet rate on the vertical axis against time on the horizontal axis. I will look first at the blue line, which is chromium using the app ratio one to two. And you can see that it grows its rate exponentially up to about five seconds, and then it transmits stably, filling the forward capacity of the link. This is for an 8.5, 1.5 link, so 8.5 megabits forward, 1.5 return, and the quick flow achieves 8.4 megabits per second. If you keep the act ratio one to two as specified in quick, and then you reduce the return capacity to 100 kilobits. So you have a, a capacity which is now constrained one to 100 ratio. Um, the forward rate is significantly reduced, down to five megabits in this case. Um, this is BBR data. Um, if you know BBR, you'll recognize the, the, the rather stable response. You'll also see that the red line slopes slightly upwards for some bizarre reason, which maybe you could explore in ICCRG and ask them why, because it doesn't seem right, but it, it is the way BBR works. What happens if you change the act ratio? If you change the act ratio, quick changes the behavior back to the original. So the black line is almost coincident with the blue line. The forward path is completely filled and the return paths for this traffic. It's, it's a stable situation. It works OK. And the default mode in Chromium is actually to do this change dynamically, moving from the at ratio 2 after 100 packets down to the at ratio 10. But um, that's not what the ITF Quick Working Group's currently picked up on. Next slide, please. This is the result with Reno. Maybe you thought that Chromium was using BBR and that was the reason why it worked. Well, it certainly worked smoother with Chromium, but even if, if we just look at Reno and we look in this case at the return path, you can see that the acts follow more or less the behavior you'd expect. TCP has a certain number of acts per second. Quick with an app ratio one to two has a similar number of acts per second which is what you'd expect. However, the acts are bigger, so they still consume more capacity. If you thin TCP acts, they reduce. And if you use an app ratio one to 10, then you get a performance where 
the ratio is reduced, of course. So this is really showing what you'd expect. So while I'm doing this, uh, let's look at some um, other type of data. Next slide shows the results for um, book downloads. This is book download of 100 megabytes of data. Um, you can see the download here for a 50 megabit path. Um, so it's, a, it's using a higher speed forward link and we get 28 megabits per second out of which finding flow. Maybe we would get more if we tuned the flow control more. <laughs> there is a limit here. But immediately you move to a higher asymmetry. In the 50.5 case, you can see that the capacity has been limited. The forward rate has reduced and therefore the time to complete has increased and the overall throughput becomes 18 megabits rather than 28 megabits. The same message. Basically, your path is being constrained by the return link acts. The return link acts do matter and we have access to act thinning in, on the path. What can we do? Next slide, please. Well, the first thing is we could find out what's on the path. So we had path awareness and we discovered that there was something on the path with a certain act rate or a certain capacity limit. We could adjust our transport in response and respond to that. I mean, that's a good thing to do. And that's a thing that we'd love to see emerge from path awareness. You know, you, you find out what's on your path and you adjust to it. Unfortunately, this is a luxury where you, you don't have at the moment. Um, people sit using their laptops using whatever network infrastructure they have and they don't really know how that's operating or what the constraints are so the transports can't figure this out if, but they can figure out when they want to reduce for other reasons I mean, there are other reasons why you might want to change the act pattern and these are purely transport related not path related for instance to reduce the interrupt rate on your um, device um, your server device um, or because you've got another congestion controller that's you know doesn't need an act frequently maybe only needs one in every hundred packets so there are good reasons why you might want to choose very big act ratios but I think these are all defined by the transport operations Jana has a draft in the quick working group that looks at this aspect it doesn't really solve my problem that I started with which is how to deal with a path that is naturally very asymmetric because um, you wouldn't know to adapt. Can I go to the next slide? Mm, okay. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, um, act traffic is still a lot. Uh, because it's using a one to two act ratio, what happens when this traffic is injected on the paths that we've been speaking about? Well, a uh, link can't see inside a quick packet. It's not aware of the contents because it's encrypted. So a queue builds in the router, the router becomes congested, and we end up with a delay and a rate limit, which is what we saw evidence of. If we looked at the delay, we see the delay creeping up as well. Um, the solution to this could be deploy some form of AQM, use a shorter queue to control the delay, simply resulting in higher act loss um, due to router queuing. Um, we'd also lose some non-ACK frames, which probably will have some impact on the transport, in this case, quick, uh, but it's the best a router can do. Perhaps some form of fair queuing might help within the device to stop you deleting packets from other flows that really disrupt a different flow causing collateral damage. And that also will have implications for queuing is not without its own costs. So um, I'm motivating that choosing the right default would save a lot of mess. If you don't know how to set that default because you don't have a signal from the path, then you have to choose a number and you have to choose that number wisely. One to 10 appears to be a number that works consistently with what has been deployed for TCP. So, next slide. Here's my question slide. I'm more than happy to take questions on this. We have a number of slides that are 
related to this and similar topics, and we've been talking about these on the ETOSAT mailing list. So um, if you want to talk a lot about it, please um, join that mailing list. I'll take questions now and be happy to try and answer them. Going once. Going twice. Um, I guess we will um, see you all on the ETOSAT mailing list. Thanks a lot, Corey. Yeah, see you then. That was fascinating. Thanks for that. Okay, John. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm yes. going to can indeed. Pretty quick because this is actually a follow up to earlier data where I just wanted to add in the uh, error rate measurements. Next page, please. So, you know, the problem statement is um, similar to what Corey was talking about for different reasons. You know, the TCP transfer protocols don't perform well over high latency links, um, particularly with, the re with respect to error recovery. We Generally, have always used um, TCP spoofing. Can't do that with any encrypted transport, particularly quick. Next page. So we set out to try to measure how bad the performance was. This is with Google Quick because that's what's you know what we see in our network. Um, this is really our test drive. You can come back and read this if you want to. Next page. So this is there was two test setups, one where we went through our own equipment to test the path with PEP, and one where we just let it go directly through and our quit was not involved to compare. So basically that gives us both spoofed and non-spoofed TCP as part of the comparison. But the delay it added in both cases was the same. Next page. So we did some different testing variants. Um, th you know, two versions of HTTP um, and uh, one gigabit connection. We did three file sizes. I'm only going to talk about one of them because the answers were essentially consistent. Um, so one gigabyte files, and then we tried three different packet loss rates. We actually tried four. We tried 10% loss. That was so bad. We didn't have time to figure out what was going on. And so we just kind of dropped that for from the point of view of this uh, paper we were writing. Next page, please. This is what I want to talk about. So here are the results. Um, you know, with no packet loss, spoofing could go really fast on our 250 meg link. Um, the HP 2.0 was limited by by uh, by the chromium, I think. Um, and so originally, this is what my last presentation was about, um, you know, comparing comparatively quick, which you can't do a spoof on, the speed is slower because of you got to do the end-to-end -end latency. But a particular interest for right now, why I wanted to present again is, you know, when we tried the packet loss rates, you could see that that the um, a packet loss, of course, as expected, reduces the throughput um, for all three. The PEP one kind of compensates, which is what it's designed to do. Uh, without PEP, though, it starts dropping down um, significantly. And of course, the reason being that um, when you drop something, you've got to recover it with this end end delay. Um, you know, the part of what we were motivated, part of it was to uh, talk about other air recovery uh, scenarios. Um, you know, I was looking at loops like things and uh, stuff within quick to do FEC and things like that. Um, but also there's some path aware stuff. Um, next page, please. Uh, well, that's not, that's the next percent presentation, I guess. But anyway, the rest of this stuff is, is the uh, graphs. So I'm trying to keep this fast. So um, basically uh, I'm, I'm done and with if anybody has any questions. I'm also trying to go fast to give uh, Nicholas more time on his. So I'll ask one super quick question. If you can go back one slide. Um, so 
I find this really interesting because there's like sort of basically two things you're testing here is one, the, you know, the effect of the PEP, um, which of course doesn't work on quick um, and would need some modifications to sort of the PEP and to quick in order to make that work, which I guess is why this is interesting for this group. Um, the other thing that I find really interesting from this is if you go to the direct path numbers, um, so quick is actually operating as intended, right? Like, so it's um, part of its value proposition is that it does really well on exceptionally crappy networks if there's nothing to accelerate out of the way. So I think part of the of, of the issue in terms of like talking about quick performance with, so, you know, in the quick working group, the quick working group is doing all of their testing based on sort of the right set of, of tables here, right? So, you know, they see, hey, there's no PEP because we don't have one. We're not going to implement one. We do better than TCP with no PEP on this ridiculous link. Um, whereas, yeah, so it, it'd be interesting. I don't know. It'd be interesting to maybe get this, um, uh, get these numbers in front of the quick working group. Um, well, at least those of them who are not here, I think there are a few, there are a few quick people I see in the. Yeah, we, we've talked about this on Edoset also. Yeah, I mean, if from if you just look at the the right side, I mean, Quick looks pretty good. It's doing better than TCP. Um, from our perspective, of course, we you know we sell satellite networks, so we we want Quick to be what we want Quick to be on par with a PEP TCP. So that's where we're coming from. And so basically, we know we can't PEP Quick, so we want to improve Quick to get up to these numbers. And the, the the key part being, of course, how do we recover from errors? But I agree with you on the right side. I mean, it, it, um, even with this delay, Quick is still outperforming TCP when you don't have a pet. Yeah. So, Gory? Yeah, I was wondering, John, are you going to go back and do some more measurements? Because these look really cool, but they're not quite the latest Quick. It might be slightly better now. Well, that's a good point. And we actually are in the process of staging up an internet you know, an IETF version of Quick with an H2O server and getting ready to redo all these tests, as well as some more tests related to um, um, uh, smaller interactive traffic, which is related to the, the next topic I want to talk about, which is classification coming up in a couple presentations. But yes, we're definitely continuously testing this. Going once, going twice. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how to drag my chat down so that I can type in it. Sorry. Uh, three monitors. Uh, first teleconference like that. Um, where do you want additional discussion to take place on this? Well, for right now, we've been using the Edisat list. At some point, we wanted to move over to Quick itself, um, but we were intentionally kind of staying out of the way of getting the first documents done. But since we're yeah, sure, sure, we sure, do, yeah, we, you know, I kind of didn't want to go over there until I had more concrete proposals. Yeah, sure. Um, and like I said, I, I didn't have an opinion about what the right answer was. I just wanted to make sure that uh, I knew where to look. Um, yeah. And uh, related thing, um, so you're standing up basically to be able to test bed with um, dash twenty eight or whatever, whatever we're doing in quick uh, yeah, protocols now. Yeah, we're we're definitely putting it since we're just now bringing it up. We're going for dash twenty eight. Okay, uh, I would be I, I would be interested in uh, trying to do the same. Similar kinds of testing and seeing if we're able to duplicate results. Uh, if you could, if you could, yeah. You know, will you be describing what you're doing on the Edisat mailing list also? Uh, yes. When you know we've been slowed down, of course, by everybody else since we're all working out of out of home. But yeah, sure. That yeah. that that is definitely what we are going to do. So we're like I said, we're we're definitely interested in uh, trying to participate in this also. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, Nico. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so this talk is in the same um, topic than the one that was addressed just now. It is just um, 
an update on the thing we had experienced on what is the satellite pass and uh, what is the problem we have with Quick in, in this case. So I think you can go to the next slide. The next slide is the actual exact same one than the one I presented in the previous IETF meeting. Um, the point here is saying that the satellite is very strange uh, network, to it. but it's just one part of the very stranger thing. So if you go to the next slide, um, basically, when you, you, we have end users using satellite, uh, satellite accesses, um, we have, if we look at, we have first the internet on the left, which is a very high data rate and low latency and no losses. Then on the satellite ISP networks, we have a high data rate, but then now we have more congestion losses. Uh, the satellite access network on its own uh, shows very viable data rate, uh, no losses, uh, unless you are on very heavy, heavy rain in India and some frequent, specific frequencies. And But the latency is high here. And then on the local area network, uh, we have an average data rate, but now we also have losses um, that can occur on a Wi-Fi link. So if you go to the next slide, um, when we have an end-to-end, -end, uh, for Earth, the third path that were mentioned in the vocabulary document are very important because we have here four third paths with very different characteristics. But our reality with Quick is that our end-to-end -end, uh, is uh, variable data rate, high latency, and congestion and Wi-Fi losses. Um, so, so for these kind of things, um, it's very complex for us to see how um, we can actually have relevant end-to-end uh, -end protocols when local breakout is not possible. We can first try to adapt the end-to-end -end protocol that what we have tried to be doing by experiencing to what extent Quick is actually showing good performances in these cases. Or uh, another way to do it is to inform the endpoint of the past characteristics. Um, so I think you can go to the next slide or even I don't have lots of time. I, I made very wordy slides because I wasn't sure. Uh, uh, my audio or anything was working. So if you, go to, you can go to this, or these are the basically the scenarios that we are considering in the uh, drafts for uh, synchronization or for our tests between uh, Aberdeen, Hughes, and ourselves. Um, so basically, what I will show here is some results. One is end to end without split, so it will be green. So we have been using Pico Quick servers or H2O servers, and then on the client side, we either have PicoQuick or uh, Curl. Um, and we compare that with different flavors of uh, PEP SAL, which is an open source TCP proxy. And so we have IPF servers and IPF clients, and we have losses between the PEP SAL and the client. So we have different configuration of PEP to see um, the problem we have been experiencing and to see to what extent we can tune the PEP. Though. Um, I will not have time to go through all the results, but if you go to the next slide, um, basically this is the case where we have the same case that Gori showed earlier when we have 50 meg download and 10 megabits upload. Um, what we got, what we can see here, um, so I always have this kind of representation. Uh, we have the received rate on the first figure and the second figure is a received data. So we can see that uh, I will not go through the different specifics of all the PEPs. I'm available if you want to discuss about these results afterwards. I have more uh, com details on to understand the results. But what we can see is um, when we tune the buffer sizes on our TCP proxies, we can reach the very high BDP. Otherwise, even the default TCP is not always uh, able to reach uh, the high BDP of the network. And these TCP proxies let us have some uh, proposed objectives for the transmission time of different file sizes. So what we have done, if you go to the next slide, is looking what happens when we take a PicoQuick server and a PicoQuick client, or take an H2O server and a PicoQuick client, and vice versa. The idea was to see first um, what is the impact of um, the what are the performances of when you choose one 
one quick uh, um, version and another uh, quick client. Because sometimes when we see evaluations of performances, we have the same flavor of different quick implementations. So we wanted to see how this impacts the end-to-end -end performances in these use cases. Um, what? Um, well, one of the first thing we can see on the figure on the left with Pico Quick Client is that um, we don't have any results for the hundred megabytes when we have H2 Ho server and Pico Quick Client. Um, and basically, we had a problem. Uh, we just take default versions of the different implementations, and we had too many retransmissions of one packet. So we had a disconnect. So here we can see that uh, the fact that the Pico Quick server manages the maximum act delay and act delay component of the part of the Pico Quick server um, better is very important. Another thing is um, when we compare um, the different uh, Pico Quick always does better uh, than H2 Ho servers, and that's because it is using BBR. Uh, so we tried to see what happens when we choose Reno in Pico Quick, and we still had lots of much better performances. So um, the thing is, the evil, the evil is always in the details. We could see that at least some transport parameters are different, such as congestion, initial congestion window, but it's not very different, and the initial latency. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. Um, here's another representation of what, when we see what happens better. Uh, basically, we see the amount of data received uh, with PicoQuick client and or curl client. What we can see here is that PicoQuick is the only one to actually meet the, the same performances as the one we have when we have a TCP proxy. The good thing is, if you have PicoQuick client and PicoQuick server, then you can actually reach the performances of the TCP prep and splitted approach of uh, satellite networks. Um, the next few slides are things I don't have time to go through, but they are here for your information. That are all the use cases, but I don't have time. So I think um, you can go to the slide 13. I am available if you want to discuss these results. But the main thing is here that we know that we cannot deploy uh, uh, condition control that is uh, relevant for all use cases. Uh, knowing some path characteristics can help because we've seen that by tuning the, RT, the initial RTT or tuning some flow control parameters helped um, uh, PicoQuick to actually reach and meet uh, the performances with, on, um, on, uh, with uh, TCP proxies. Um, if, um, if you go to the next slide, the main thing is why PicoQuick meets the objectives. Basically, it's because it doesn't follow the standard. Um, here are a list of the different parameterization. Uh, you can see that one of the main differences is in the congestion control that is different uh, between PicoQuick uh, servers and H2 host servers. Um, and so we are actually working on to see what are the relevant parameters and what parameters are uh, game changers. But to Go back to what Go represented earlier. If you go to the slide 15, um, another thing that PicoQuick does not as default today uh, is the acknowledgement strategy, where basically, um, if you look at uh, what we show here, is the amount of data that is sent by the Quick client or the curl client. Uh, what we can see is that Quick. Uh, a Pico Quick client tends to actually increases very quickly the amount of data that is sent in the acknowledgement. So there is some strange uh, uh, coalescing uh, algorithm in Pico Quick. Um, basically, the acknowledgement ratio is not constant throughout the whole communication. So these kind of things, uh, I'm not really sure now, but this is to show that there are very important interactions between what could happen between a server and what could happen uh, and a client. And the next slide is my last slide on what we are going to do next. So as I said, we are working on to see what are the actual relevant parameters for the satellite use cases. And we are going to implement the zero RTT draft that we have. 
Um, so uh, we want to see if there are some things that are implemented in Pico Quick that are relevant for everyone and that should be included in the standard and not only for our specific satellite use case. And I think that the act management, as Gori showed, is very one of the way to do that. Another thing we have is um, um, basically the all that is related to the flow control. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention here is uh, what very matters to us and I think to the path uh, uh, aware network re research group is um, the management of sub passes with very different characteristics and when we have losses uh, this impacts a lot so in quick we are working at the moment on adding coding in quick FEC in quick or uh, quick proxies or all the approach that we can have to uh, be adapted to that okay and so we are at the moment have two implementations. We are working on making something quite flexible uh, and making every um, available to anyone to have some sort of fabric with which you could try easily any quick implementation of a different use cases. So we want to make all the code we have been we have been using available. I'm sorry if I was quick, but uh, I don't have didn't have much time, and I'm here if you have any question. Uh, we've got two at least. Uh, first, we have Spencer. My, my, but, well, not anymore. Uh, but 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 my uh, my my thing was just to be very very brief and to, to thank you guys uh, for bringing this uh, information. All, you know, all the all the people who are bringing satellite information in to uh, PanRG, which is very important, and I think that's where a lot of the satellite stuff belongs right now but thank you thank you for doing that i know you're not everybody's getting a lot of feedback but you can hear our brains chugging out here if you get close thank you thank you and lucas hello can you hear me Okay, great. Sorry for the background noise. I'll try to be quick. Um, so just uh, just some clarification questions. Uh, I wondered if this was testing HTTP3, um, and if so, um, is this just a single resource transfer um, of a large file, which I think it might be? Um, and then uh, conjoined with that, uh, you mentioned curl, but curl has two possible um, quick backends. So I wondered which of those two you were using. Was it NG TCP2 or uh, Quiche? Um, so for the, thank you for the question. Uh, we have been, we have not been using H3 as far as I think, because we have just been using the default uh, uh, the code that was available for Pico Quick and uh, Quick and uh, H2 host, so it was I think H2, not H3, and we have been using NGTCP2 in the curl. Okay, thank you. And Chana. Hi, thank you for this presentation. I'm, um, I had a couple of couple of comments. First, can you go back to the slide that uh, that compares the different uh, implementations, H2O and EcoQuick? Yeah, that one. I think we just passed it. Yeah. This one. Yeah. No, not this one. Slide 14. 14, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the one. Thank you. Um, so I just want to point out a couple of things that, uh, uh, first, broadly speaking, it's not that uh, Pico Quick is not following the spec. The spec requires a minimum of 12 80 bytes. Um, doesn't doesn't limit how large you can send them. H2O right now matches whatever the client uses for the max packet size. So if you use an H2O server and a client that uses 1350 bytes, for example, then H2O server will use 1350 bytes. Pico Quick might be fixing it at a high uh, value there. Um, this is just an example of some uh, uh, difference in implementations that you're likely to see going forward. The question I would I would encourage you to consider is uh, whether these what the cost of doing these things is. 
Right? I mean, you can choose a maximum packet size that's 9,000 bytes if you want. The problem is going to be it won't work where you don't have a 9,000 byte MT. So uh, a lot of the implementations are making choices uh, that allow them to work for uh, most of the parts on the internet. Uh, and I would encourage you to think about how to make um, endpoints work well, given that they also have to work on other parts that are not satellite. The same holds true for the condition controller as well. The uh, point here is to try and understand what the, I, I would suggest that uh, you might want to look at what the condition controllers are actually doing and then consider how they would work on the public internet as well as on satellite networks. And there's just a broad comment. All of these evaluations are wonderful to see how these implementations, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the H2O implementation. It's moving rapidly. A lot of these implementations are moving quite rapidly and uh, I'd encourage you to look at uh, when you publish these results, publish the particular commit that you're using for the code um, so that people know which commit you're looking at. I can tell you that from a past commit performance would have been substantially worse than from a more recent commit of H2O. Just even a month ago would be quite different. So I would encourage you to, to keep looking at the performance and also keep uh, uh, publishing the date that you took the code or the commit number that you, the, the, the commit hash that you used for the servers. Um, a final comment, uh, in general, we don't expect uh, right now, the quick endpoints don't really have any way to communicate to the network uh, any things and the network doesn't have a way to communicate to the quick endpoints at their satellite networks. In in all of these cases, I think it's useful and valuable to look at how endpoint behavior can be changed so that it works well for satellite networks and for other networks. I mean, whatever changes, if, if we simply tweak the endpoints to work really well for satellite networks, that's not going to be, that's not going to be very useful because as a deployment, I can't simply tune my server to use uh, um, measures that are great for satellite networks because I don't know when my traffic is going to go over one. Thanks a lot. We also have John sure. Porter. John, could you keep it to 30 seconds? Can I try to answer? Or you maybe we wait for John Hunter and then we go back. Well, I was going to say, I agree with what John has said at the end there. I mean, I've always viewed it as the defaults can't be friendly in satellite. What you need is to be able to figure it out automatically you can't require the end users to uh figure it out to do it and tweak so that's the key thing is we need to have mechanisms to dynamically determine that that's the, that that's the situation and um if i may uh, thank you for for the comment i just wanted to uh say that um I understand the cost of deploying uh, these uh, things for the general use case. We just don't have the, the I don't have the, the data for that. So I can share the data I have and, and thank you for for this. Uh, I know that increasing the buffer sizes everywhere can be costly on data centers. Uh, so we are actually also working on adapting endpoints, seeing what we can do on the endpoints. That is one of the things we will investigate. And um, for your comment on the commit version of the code, um, we will do that in the future and also um, try to make our uh, uh, code, everything we do to orchestrate our tests. Uh, everything is open source, but we just don't have uh, made it public yet. So I want to make that public so that anyone can actually, actually test also with different commits and Thank you very much for your comment. And thank you, and and thank you everyone for the uh, for the questions. So moving on, uh, back to John Porter. John. Okay. Um, I wanted to put this together to to sort of get some new discussion going on on another problem that we care about a lot, which is um, classifications. Next page, please. So I'm not going to read the Wikipedia thing, but basically, you know, classification largely depends on transport headers and application headers, and has traditionally done so. Um, and you know, port numbers being the primary things. Next page. Uh, 
um, for network operators, you know, traffic classification is very important for meeting customer service expectations. Of course, my experience is satellite, but I believe this to be true elsewhere. Um, kind of ties into asymmetric paths. Also, you know, the customer, you want to make the VOIP work. And, you know, even if somebody's doing uploads and that kind of thing. Um, so it's really the, the, the key thing here is that the, from our perspective, the last mile is really the first mile because the network where your user is connected is usually the one that needs the classification the most because it's the end last hop and it probably is it probably is the constraining network. Um, besides prioritizing over the interactive traffic over background, for example, the, the, the device such as the satellite terminal actually may have multiple paths. So that's another thing, you know, um, for example, if there is a, a, a LTE path and a satellite path, you want to be able to, to classify and decide which types to send which path. Because this second path is in the terminal, it's not visible to the end user and device. So it's a little bit different than multipath when it's the multipath is all the way to the end device. Next page. Obviously, pervasive encryption, encryption is making this hard to do. That's a good thing, and we're not objecting to that at all. Um, we, you know, we there's techniques like deep packet inspection, DNS correlation, SNI, etc. It still tra classify traffic when we can't see the headers. Um, but unfortunately, anything we can do to classify an attacker can do for other reasons. So the question I'm trying to get discussion going on is, can the end user's device signal the network? And this is not the first time this question's come up. It's come up for many reasons. Um, so that we can get classification information to that first file device that it can use to get across the, the first network, but in such a way that then that information doesn't propagate farther than that and leak. Um, or minimizes the amount of privacy information that it gives out. You know, DSCPs are a natural option, but I think this is even in the in um, Spencer's document, you know, there's the age old problem of how do you trust the source? Um, although I think the world's changing and maybe that question could be re-examined um, when the user's talking about its own traffic. Um, and your idea I've been playing around with but haven't had a lot enough time to write the draft yet is to use a mask-like technique to securely send metadata to just the first mile device to give it enough information to do that first level classification. Next page. Basically, the, the this is what I was talking about on the, the bottom two pictures is that case where I could either have a separate channel to the device from the end user that he could send me information about it, or it could just be an outer quick header it, all it has extra in it is it lets me see the DSCPs or whatever, enough information to classify. Lots of work to have to go into making that happen, right? But that's kind of the idea. Next page. So, you know, I, I wanted to get some discussion going on it. We we really care about this problem, We you know, and, and we think it's going to become more and more important, um, especially when quick starts really getting out there. Um, and the other, you know a key question, but not the only one, is how do you get the end user or basically the uh, client developers to buy into this idea and provide ways for the end user to enable it? So that's all I had. I was, I'm hoping we could just get some discussion going. Anybody have any questions or comments? Comments especially. Observations. Gary, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, th thanks, John. No, I have, haven't really read that one through before. Th this is an interesting proposal. Um, please read my draft in TSVWG on encryption and comment. I would love to join you in exploring this. I think this is an interesting problem that where we can make some 
real inroads. Yeah, your your document was actually the one of the ones I was thinking of. This topic has actually definitely already come up before. But I was, you know, in terms of I was trying to tie it in here. It's like, well, can we make the path aware of the classification? Is kind of the question, right? Without you know, just enough to um, make use of it as a part of the network where it's needed and then drop it when it's for the rest of the network where you don't need it. Do you need to drop it, John? Well, I don't need to drop it, but I think some people might view that as privacy information. And it depends on, it depends on how you signal it. I mean, that's part of it, right? Yeah. But I think like the thing that appeals about DSCPs is they're designed to be dropped at the edge of the network. You could or you could argue with my co-chair on that one. Um, okay. <laughs> the, 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 this is this is a great space, both with mask and without. I like both approaches. I'm. I think think you should write a draft. Okay. Yeah, that's the intent. Cool, Spencer. I, I agree that you should try to draft also. Um, please let, let me know if, if we can help. Um, Brian, am I remembering that uh, the evolving notion of trust uh, is lit covered in the research draft, research questions draft? It is, it is alluded to. I wouldn't go out as far as to say that we have anything like an answer. Oh, no, no, no. Well, that's the questions, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, but basically, the, the, we're telling the research group that it should be okay to, um, it should be, it, you know, it should be okay for us to be digging in this, a hole that's shaped Absolutely. like that. Yep. Oh, th thank you. Colin. Hi. Uh, I'm kind of wondering how much the, the state of the art in traffic classification has advanced and whether the, whether it's now more feasible to um, verify if an endpoint is telling the truth when it's marking traffic than it used to be. Um, that's an interesting question. I have, I'd have to think about that. I mean, for some types of classification, I think you probably could do a pretty good job, particularly, for example, if somebody claims to have the class of VOIP and is sending gigabytes of data, you pretty much can believe he's lying. Uh, that's that's certainly an interesting question to explore. Maybe you could get somewhere with that. So I think Chris Wood might have an answer. <laughs> you might. Maybe you're going to say the same thing. I don't know. Um, I think I was about to say the same thing, but but you go ahead and say it first, and, and I'll see okay. if I agree. We can say it together. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, so the, in the privacy uh, enhancements in the the Parity, uh group, we are there's a particular draft floating around that looks at uh, traffic analysis and website fingerprinting in general, which is um, sort of this classification problem that you speak of. Uh, and it surveys um, basically the relevant research that we could find uh, talking about how easy or, or not it is to uh, do this in practice. Um, most of it is focused on things like Tor, flows like Tor, just because that's where privacy and anonymity is most important, but um, uh, of course the, the techniques also apply elsewhere. So uh, I, I encourage you to go check that out if you're interested to know, um, you know what's been done in this space and how feasible it is. Um, and of course, if you're interested in engaging with that group, I think they'd be uh, more than keen to sort of uh, uh, help out. Just to be clear, you said pair RG? Pair G, whatever you want to call it. All right. Okay. So yeah, I, I threw myself in the uh, in the queue as well. Um, one to kind of point you in the direction of 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 Pierg, uh, as well. Um, I think there's also just I don't I'm not as active in this space as I was say about ten years ago, but I know that there was um, uh, if you look at the uh, at least the marketing uh, in uh, security um, traffic analysis, right? Like, so 
so enterprise systems for doing um, outbound uh, sort of extrusion analysis as well as intrusion analysis. Um, a lot of that marketing in the past five years has gone um, in the direction away from the direction of um, signature um, based uh, traffic analysis, like basically saying this is a good packet versus this is a bad packet, or this is a good flow versus a bad flow based on on um, matching like known malware characteristics and has moved toward, I mean, all of it in the marketing is called AI, right? Like, so some of it might actually use machine learning and some of it might just use tweaked th thresholds. But um, a key to a lot of this is the is behavioral analysis, right? Like, so actually looking at what the packets are doing, which is based on the, um, the understanding that, you know, the efficiency of a network is bounded by um, how much bandwidth you use for a given information exchange and how much um, latency you're willing to tolerate. Uh, so your traffic's going to push you very as close as, as it can possibly to the um, the bottom of the bandwidth and latency um, consumption windows. And that basically means that the traffic is going to have certain characteristics just in the inter-arrival times. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of people who don't show up here uh, who are in that security space. Some of them are hiding behind marketing, which is is marketing, and some of them might actually um, have uh, traffic classification that would be more than good enough for the type of first mile signaling that would be here. So I don't know how to get them to engage here um, uh, or how to get them to engage with, with sort of like, you know, how can we use these technologies to make transport work without having to, to um, uh, look at the payload, uh, but I think there's definitely uh, work that can be used in this space. Okay, thank you. Um, Next up is PRG. Okay, the um, that also triggered a thought I want I forgot to bring up with Gory's presentation about Axe, which ties in here, which is one of the concerns I've had, but I don't know how how big of a concern it is. Is that I hear people sometimes talking about padding Axe to make them less obviously X so that uh, middle boxes won't delete them, which that's a good thing from a point of view of privacy, but it then aggravates the act asymmetry problem even more and also then makes it hard potentially to, to do the pattern recognition. But anyway, I don't know how big of a concern that is, but it's something I've definitely thought about. Chris. Uh, yeah, just to follow up on that point, I, I do think uh, you're going to see more pushes in that direction in the future, in particular, actually making use of the padding mechanisms that were built into TLS 1.3 and into QUIC and even HTTP 3 and HTTP 2. Um, so uh, I, I can't comment on like how painful it's going to make life for people, but uh, it was likely going to happen. Jonna. And I'll close the queues after this because we're um, out of time. Okay, very quickly. Um, I was going to second what Chris said. There's a lot of movement in that direction in general. Um, and I think a lot of these classifiers that we're talking about also still use things that are exposed right now, such as SNI to make a lot of uh, uh, conclusions about the traffic that they're seeing. And a lot of the push in general in the community is towards hiding that information as well. So <clears throat> going forward, while that classification might be effective now, the hope is that it's not as effective going into the future. My hope anyway. That, that's kind of, and I understand why things are going that way, but then that makes my original problem harder, which is, okay, how do I yes. meet the guy and do it? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I completely agree with you. And I, I see that as a problem statement for the research group, broadly speaking, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Right. Okay. Bang, the last presentation for today. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello, this is Pum from China Mobile. And I'm glad to introduce my work on APN and some considerations about PAN. 
Um, they are a little same in the name and we have some connections or difference. Uh, that's why I want to have the presentation and explanation about it. I hope it will give some help or be valuable to our group. So I will introduce these two aspects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, first part is about APN6. The motivations of, of APN6 that new applications put forward higher requirements of network and the network operators need to be able to provide fine um, granular clarity and even application level as a guarantee to achieve better quality of uh, per, um, expert uh, experience for the users. For example, 5G and the verticals generates more and more um, applications with um, diverse network requirements and revenue producing uh, apps such as online gaming, live video streaming, um, and much more demanding requir requirements. Um, nowadays, network operators are typically unaware of which applications are uh, traversing their network, which is because network is decoupled from app. So they not able to provide fine and granularity traffic operations for specific applications. And there are no corresponding revenue increase in that might be enabled by differentiated service providers. And what APN wants is to add application knowledge to the network layer, which can enable finer granularity requirements of applications to be specified to the network operator. And as the uh, IPv6 is being widely deployed, um, the prog programmability provided by them can be augmented by convenient app info. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the challenge of traditional uh, differentiated service pre uh, provide versioning, we don't uh, we didn't do that because with uh, IPv4 protocol the Packets are not able to carry enough uh, information for indicating applications and expressing their service requirements. And the network device mainly rely on the five turbo of the packets of DPI. Five turbos used for SL matching of traffic are not the direct uh, application information that are not capable enough for new app addresses. <laughs> The deep packet inspection may introduce capex or opex and uh, security uh, issues. Um, what's more, um, about the SDN-based solution, the controlling loop is too long to be suitable for uh, fast service provisioning for critical applications, and there are need to be too many interfaces involved in the loop. Uh, next slide, please. According to those problems, how APN can help? APN6 aims to satisfy the um, application awareness requirements demanded by new service and provide differentiated service treatment and five grand uh, traffic op operations. It uses uh, IPv6 or SRV6 network programmability to convene uh, app info in the data plan, allowing the final and requirements from apps to be specified to the network. So it can convince application information such as application identification and uh, SLA service requirements. It also allows the uh, network to quickly adapt the perform, perform the necessary actions for the guarantees by um, SRV6 pass. Um, so next slide, please. So the key elements of AP, APN6 are application info conveying, uh, app info and uh, network capabilities matching uh, and network performance measurement. And it should be noted in the element one that the ap application info conveying shouldn't be enforced by, uh, but provide an open option for app to decide whether to um, input this app info into the, um, its data stream. If it opens, uh, element two can be realized according to the uh, info. 
so um, the appropriate network service can be selected. Um, and for the LM3, according to the measurement, it can update the match between the app and the corresponding network service for better uh, fine gram reality uh, SLA um, complaints. Next uh, slide, please. And we also have a framework of APN6. The key uh, components include service aware app, an app aware uh, edge device, app aware process head end, and the mid point and the uh, end point. So for the service aware app, uh, it's a host opens uh, an application characteristic information of the service aware app and generates a packet which carries the application characteristic information in the encapsulation, but uh, it is not mandatory to be uh, service aware. Um, and the uh, um, app aware edge device, um, its, um, its network device receives pack packets from applications and obtains uh, application character inform information. And if the application is not service um, aware app, the application character uh, with take information can be retrieved by packet inspection and uh, um, derived from service information. Um, the um, app aware edge device adds the app information in the uh, encapsulation on behalf of the application. Um, the packet carrying the app information will be sent to the App aware process head and uh, uh, app information will be used to determine the path between the head end and the end point for forwarding the packet. And for the uh, app aware process head and uh, receives packets and obtains the uh, app information. And the set of path tunnels or SR policy exists between the head end and the end point. And the Head end maintains a matching relationship between the app information and the path between the um, head end and the end point. Um, the head end determines a path between the head end and the end point according to the app information carried in the package and the matching relationship with it. Um, and next is the midpoint, um, provides the path service according to the path set up by the head end. The midpoint may also adjust the results locally to guarantee the service requirements um, depending on a specific policy and the application where information conveyed by the packet. And then finally, the process of the specific service path will end at the end point. The service requirements information can be removed at the end point together with the author uh, encapsulation or go to the uh, go to be convened with the packet. So in all this, we uh, the network is aware of service requirements uh, expressed by the applications. According to the service uh, requirement information carried in the packet, the network is able to adjust its results fast in order to satisfy the requirement of the applications. So next slide, please. Um, so there are some advantages of using IPv6 to support APN6 uh, includes, and first is uh, IP reach ability. Then uh, it is much easier to achieve since both app and the network are based on uh, IPv6. And it can carry very rich, uh, very rich information relevant to uh, applications. If the application information not recognized, the packet will be forwarded based on pure IPv6. Um, it is also little dependency because um, they are only based on forwarding plan of a device and it can quick response. The next slide, please. And there are some use cases that can benefit from the application awareness introduced by uh, APN6. 
including as a guarantee network slicing, deterministic networking, uh, service fun uh, function training, network measurement, and edge computing. And, and what I want to say is that edge computing is a new trend that might um, influence the network. Uh, it may be difficult to update all the operator's device, but uh, may be more easily to change the edge device. So it may also um, benefit PAM. Okay, next slide, please. Um, it's about security considerations. Um, because we um, expose some uh, information about network, so um, uh, accurate um, volume, um, volume of security uh, mechanism would be required in order to prevent any leak of critical information. And there are also some multi-domain um, problems need to be talked more. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, we had the sun meeting in ITF uh, 105 meetings and uh, get a lot of support. And I'm prepared to apply for the both in 108. So if you are interested in it, welcome to join. Uh, next five slides, please. Okay, um, I have read the draft of PAN and have some considerations of PAN and the APM. Um, but I'm not sure if all of them are right, so if it is mistaken, please point out. Um, I think the same things of them is to provide better network and application service. Uh, they require the interaction between network and the user or uh, endpoint or application. Um, but the difference is that um, Pen wants the endpoints or application to get path information and to select path. Uh, it works in um, layer 4 or layer uh, 7. Um, APM wants to endpoint uh, or application tells requirement of network to network. It works. Uh, in uh, layer uh, three. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and we can see some um, trends about network. Um, today's network is best effort, so cust uh, customer won't expect expect too much of it. In most cases, they can tolerate its uh, unreliability or instability, but network will be better than before. Um, we can see that 5G of mobile um, network can give a low latency, high bandwidth, and multi-access um, connection. Some new trends like DSN DNet um, computing in the network put forward high demand of network, uh, of network. And there is also a trend of network programmability, the interaction between network and uh, um, user or endpoint, which is both um, APN and uh, PN want. Um, although some protocols that are not feasible after analysis in the draft what not to do, um, we have the possibility to be used or to give in the direction of some new protocol uh, or technique. And for example, the flow over of IPv6, I think it is widely used in uh, load sharing and uh, SRVP is an uh, important protocol of TSN or DEFNET. Next slide, please. And there are also some existing services that are a little similar with uh, Pen. Um, for example, when you want to download something, um, users can choose different servers, different network points, or different operators. And when playing games, users may can uh, choose different network points by themselves, or automatic uh, service which will uh, choose different paths by application itself. Um, though they are not the, in, the same, um, in the same way of PAM, but some of the goals are the same. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so the key problem, I think, are about the business and technology. The existing draft mentions that it causes a problem of who operates the network, an uh, endpoint um, app or operator. Uh, I worked in China Mobile and also have some discussion with my um, colleagues. Um, there might be the chance of cooperation that a provider can rent a network's operation right from operator. 
uh, motivations may be that there are a few typical applications which account from uh, for most traffic may be care about uh, SLA. Uh, evaporator can really have some benefits from selling the um, controlling right that can be done. Um, but the difficulty is that it requires the development, develop, development of device in operator's network and some new management about the uh, new business, so which has also um, been mentioned in the existing um, draft. So for the technology, um, the draft one not to do really gives a good analysis, and I think that uh, it needs common exploration of multiple technologies by the new trend of the network. Okay, um, that's all for my presentation. Thanks. Any questions? Wes. Wes, you are muted. Or possibly I can't hear you. Neither can I. Okay. WebEx thinks Wes is talking. But I can't hear anything from him. Do you want to put it in Jabber in the chat and we can relay? Any other questions first? Go ahead and start typing, Wes. Actually, I have to say that's the, oh, go ahead, Spencer. Yeah, well, Wes is typing. I just wanted to uh, thank you all for uh, bringing the APN uh, discussion here and con uh, contrasting it with what we're talking about usually with path aware networking. Uh, that's that is thought thought provoking. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, Wes's question is essentially, what sort of application IDs are you transmitting? Um, yeah. So what what what's in that application ID that goes goes to the sort of that that middle segment of the network? Okay. Um, we may use IDs to uh, represent um, what is the application and uh, component in the. Uh, right. What are the so Wes's question is what are the semantics of the what are the semantics of that ID? Does it say this is web traffic versus video? This is video traffic. Or what is the like? What are the semantics of that identification? Um, um, do you mean the result of the application itself? Oh, um, so uh, I I think it was like on slide. Could you go back a few slides? Um, I forget the slide number. Uh, there was a there was a picture. Uh, da, 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 keep going. This one? Yeah, this one. So the APN six framework, right? Like, so there's some information from the app aware edge that gets put into the app aware process head end and endpoint. Um, so that that's there's some application ID. Um, so what what are the semantics of that application ID? Uh, okay. Um... So the point is the point is from from Wes is that like if you're actually saying well this is web traffic or this is, um, uh, you know traffic of a particular app right like so a particular app on the phone, um, then that has a certain set of privacy characteristics that are, are um, I think quantitatively worse than the privacy characteristics of saying what the network requirements are like so in terms of like what the bandwidth is or what the 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 transmission, um, sort of like what the shape of the bin you're trying to pack in the network is. Uh, Colin also makes the point, uh, many applications send different types of traffic. So if you have a application ID that is assuming that the application is for a given path in a given time frame going to have heterogeneous uh, traffic behavior, 
um, that might not be enough to actually um, to actually classify to pack the bins. Um, uh, yeah, I think the idea is just to present um, a number of it, and uh, it really um, will come with some uh, some information about the network requirement, like uh, okay. The so it is it is in terms of like how much bandwidth and and what the timing looks like. Okay. Well, other questions? We're a couple of minutes over, but like nobody's kicking us out of the room. Thank you for relaying, Brian. Oh, there's Wes. <sighs> now it works. I was going to say, it was like, this is pretty amazing. This is the first time I've done two and a half hours in WebEx where we got to the very end before anybody had any audio problems. So no, I, I'm glad I could help with those. <laughs> Thanks much. I ended up switching to landline. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see you've got the, um, yeah, following the directions at the beginning. Cool. All right. Yeah, other and questions? my point perfectly, which is that, okay. um, that, that asking for what you need out of a network is generally much more privacy preserving than saying, I am X, please help me. Yep. Other questions or comments? Cool. All right. Thanks a lot for, for bringing this to us. Yeah, thank you. And just a reminder, if you have not done so, please sign up in the virtual blue sheet. And the link is in the, on the slides or in the agenda. Please put your name and affiliation there so we know you've been here listening. So I guess that's it for today. All right. Thank you very much. And I guess. Good, good job. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. We'll see you online. Yeah. Yeah. Good night slash good morning, everyone.